Hi everyone, welcome back to another video, and today we're talking about one of our favorite medications, spironolactone, and many of you may know that spironolactone is used as an androgen receptor blocker in people undergoing a feminizing transition, so oftentimes it's not enough to just have HRT through estrogen or progesterone, you oftentimes have to suppress androgen activity in the body using spironolactone to inhibit the triggering of androgen on androgen receptors. Uh, but one of the most common complaints that people get with spironolactone is that they have to pee all the time. And this is actually not really a side effect because spironolactone is also primarily used as a diuretic, specifically a potassium sparing diuretic in people with high blood pressure or who have issues with their potassium levels. Um, so today we're gonna talk about how spironolactone makes you pee a lot and how it contributes to your water balance because with a diuretic, you are going to be excreting a lot more water and you're not gonna have water in your system. It can cause you to be dehydrated very easily. So we're gonna talk about how exactly this happens. What is the mechanism of spironolactone? How does it cause you to pee a lot? And so I'm gonna address the picture um, to the side of me, this is actually a nephron. This is the functional unit of the kidney. Yes, this is a kidney. It's not the best drawing, but I hope that it makes enough sense uh, for this kind of explanation. So we have here the different areas of the kidney. I'm just gonna walk you through this briefly before we go in depth in a specific region of the kidney. And here, this area over here with this little mess of red is the glomerulus. This is where blood is filtered. It comes in through this afferent arteriole. It goes through this big mess here. Blood gets filtered. The stuff you're filtering out is going to go in here into this tube. And then the blood that has been filtered is going to leave via the efferent arteriole. And then you get the filtrate that's going to move through the proximal convoluted tubule. It's going to go down and it's going to go through the descending loop of Henle up the ascending loop of Henle and then it's going to go through the distal convoluted tubule and then back out the collecting duct and by the time it gets to the collecting duct all the stuff you want to reabsorb is usually reabsorbed you are going to reabsorb some stuff in the collecting duct as well but by the time it gets to the collecting duct it is urine you're going to excrete it and not deal with it anymore so when we're talking about spironolactone and diuretics, we are going to be focusing on the collecting duct. This is the part that it acts on and the part where aldosterone acts on. And we're going to talk about this in some detail. So let me take you over to our next picture. And there's a mechanism that we need to talk about in terms of blood pressure regulation, because this is how we are going to produce aldosterone. Aldosterone is what is going to be inhibited by spironolactone. So we're going to walk through this pathway really quickly. So there's a type of organ in your kidney, in fact, in your collecting duct, that is called the macula densa. This is part of a system called the juxtaglomerular apparatus, and that's a really big name, but it just means that it's right next to the glomerulus. And what is the job of the macula densa? Well, its job is to sense sodium levels um, in the filtrate that's going through. And this tells us something, because water follows salt. Um, so if you have a low concentration of salt compared to water, it means you have an excess of water in that area, and it probably means that you're peeing out too much water and you're at risk of being dehydrated. So in order to save your blood pressure and keep your blood pressure in a good range, um, if your sodium levels in the collecting duct get too low, we're uh, going to assume there's a lot of water. We're going to try to keep this water as much as possible. So the macula densa is going to secrete a hormone called renin. And then renin is going to travel kind of in the blood. And then there's another compound uh, that's released by the liver called angiotensinogen. And angiotensinogen is going to be converted by renin to angiotensin 1. And then the lungs actually are going to produce angiotensin converting enzyme which is going to act on angiotensin 1, converting it 
to angiotensin 2. And angiotensin 2 is going to have a whole other mechanism of blood pressure regulation. We're not going to cover angiotensin 2 today. We're going to cover aldosterone, but angiotensin 2 is a stimulator for the production of aldosterone, which is why we have this whole pathway here. Angiotensin 2 is going to travel to the adrenal gland. Yep, the adrenal cortex, we've covered this before. It's going to go to the adrenal cortex, and it's going to stimulate production of aldosterone. And if you want to see that whole pathway, I've made videos about production of aldosterone in the adrenal cortex, but that's not important. I'm going to assume you already know how that works. But anyway, we get aldosterone production, and we're going to direct our attention back to the collecting duct. So we have cells in the collecting duct. We're just gonna have one cell here. So imagine that we've zoomed in really close on this collecting duct picture that we saw before, and we just have one cell here. And there are two membranes here. We have two openings. One is the inside of the collecting duct where the urine is passing through. And then we have the other side where there's a blood vessel, and this is where blood is passing through. So when we are reabsorbing water, our goal is to try to move the water from the urine into the blood. So it has to pass through this collecting, collecting duct cell, and this is where aldosterone is going to come in to help us make this mechanism possible. So aldosterone is going to travel inside the collecting duct cell, and it's going to bind to a mineral corticoid receptor, and I'm listing it as the aldosterone receptor. Aldosterone is a mineral corticoid. Um, mineral corticoids are the broad category that aldosterone fits under, but just to make this easier, I'm putting the aldosterone receptor. So aldosterone is going to travel into the collecting duct cell. It's going to bind to this aldosterone receptor, and it's going to upregulate. So when I say upregulate, it means it's going to stimulate the activity of two types of, well, one type of channel, uh, one type of active uh, transport mechanism. And this channel is ENAC. Uh, ENAC is a sodium channel on the apical membrane, so the side near the urine, and it is going to allow for sodium to travel into the collecting duct. So aldosterone is going to stimulate more of these channels to be on the membrane so that more sodium can come through into the cell. And then we need another mechanism to move the sodium from inside the collecting duct cell into the bloodstream. So we have this uh, molecule of ATPase. It is an enzyme, and it's an ATPase because it uses energy from ATP in order to pump sodium into the blood. But here's the thing with ATPase. We're not just going to pump sodium into the blood. We're actually going to do an exchange. So every time we exchange sodium into the blood, we're going to bring out a molecule of or uh, an atom, an ion of potassium. So this potassium is now going to be moved from the blood into the collecting duct cell, and then it's going to go through its channel out into the urine. So we are bringing in sodium, and we are kicking out potassium. And what we're doing here is we are creating gradients. So we're creating a sodium gradient. We are increasing the amount of sodium in the bloodstream because, as I said before, water follows salt. So the fact that now we have sodium in higher amounts in the blood, the water is going to flow from the urine into the bloodstream. All right, so we are getting uh, water to follow the sodium into the blood. We are increasing the amount of water in the blood. We're increasing our hydration status. We are increasing our blood pressure. Okay, so now that we understand the mechanism of how aldosterone works on the collecting duct, where does spironolactone come into play? And this is pretty simple. Once you understand this aldosterone mechanism, spironolactone is pretty easy to understand. So spironolactone is a competitive antagonist of the aldosterone receptor. So competitive antagonist means that essentially aldosterone is going to try to bind to this receptor and spironolactone is going to come in and it's going to kick it out of the way and say, nope, this is my spot now. I'm going to take over. So spironolactone is going to bind to this aldosterone receptor. And I'm going to draw this out so that we can go through it kind of step by step because I didn't want to overwhelm you all with this mechanism, how it's going to reverse things. But spironolactone is going to boot aldosterone from the receptor. It's going to say, nope, you can't bind here. And so we're not going to upregulate 
these receptors. So we're not going to allow ENACs to really have some activity. So if we don't have ENAC, sodium is going to move out of the cell. So sodium is going to go that way. Um, same thing, sodium is going to move that way. Uh, there's a more complicated mechanism. We're not, we're not going to reverse an ATPase per se, but it's not going to be as functional. So we're not going to be pumping the sodium out. So you're going to get sodium kind of building up uh, in here. It's going to leave and go into the urine. You're going to have more sodium in the urine. And likewise, we're not going to have this potassium leaving. Potassium is actually going to be spared. And this is why spironolactone is called a potassium sparing diuretic because we are saving potassium from leaving, we are keeping the potassium, and we're getting rid of the sodium. So if water follows salt, if water follows sodium, then if we boot the sodium out of the cell, then where's the water going to go? Absolutely right. The water is going to go out into the urine, and the water is going to be peed out. So you're taking the water that was in your blood... So this water here that was in your blood is going to move. It's going to be kicked out into the urine, and it's going to leave. So now, think about these volumes. If you have water leaving in high amounts, you're probably at risk for dehydration. So be careful. Uh, if you're taking spironolactone, you need to watch your hydration status. You need to make sure that you're drinking enough water and uh, because you're more likely to pee it out. So make sure that you're staying hydrated. Um, and then also... Uh, with potassium, we know that potassium can cause arrhythmias. Uh, hyperkalemia can cause some problems with your heart. So be conscious of that. Uh, you are keeping higher amounts of potassium. You're going to be more at risk for arrhythmias. So if you have a heart issue uh, where you're prone to arrhythmias, you might not want to be using spironolactone. That might be a reason not to use this as an androgen blocker. So kind of take this into account. This is just one uh, mechanism of how spironolactone has some side effects. Take all of this kind of um, at your own discretion. Think about if this is a mechanism that you'd want to deal with as a side effect. Uh, but also, it's kind of a cool mechanism. I think the kidney is fascinating. I think this hormone interaction is really cool to study, and I hope you all liked it too. And um, I'm going to cover more drugs in the future, talk about their side effects, talk about HRT and that kind of thing. But I hope you like this video and I will see you all in the next one.